Hello, welcome back, everybody. I do apologize um, if you've been watching this live. Um, we've had a few little technical issues, so uh, we've had to be away for about 20 minutes. If you're watching this later on this evening, you won't know what I'm talking about. Um, but let's just explain where we've got to so far. So we're about to make um, an eccentric coaster. We're using the eccentric chuck. So what we've done, this is this is one or a set of the coasters, the three coasters. Um, ben, go to camera three, if you would. There we are. That's what we're about to make. Okay. So basically, chestnut main coaster, and we're just infilling with lots of solid colors from some scraps that we found in the workshop. Before everything went wrong a minute ago, we were just making a few little wooden, wooden discs, okay, from a square section using side grain, creating a few of these in various timbers, okay? And now we're going to start making the recess to hold each one, glue them in, then um, plane off that top surface on the lathe so we've got a nice coaster. I'm probably going to do about three or four um, uh, inserts in this one just because I don't want you there all day, um, especially as we've had a bit of a delay in getting this to you. So what I've done is I've offset. And I mean, in fact, I'll take it off the lathe again just because we've had a bit of a, a hiccup. So that's the eccentric chuck, the back of the eccentric chuck. You can see here that I've moved it offset. So my middle position was here. I've just, let me get that in line with the camera. Middle position there. I've just moved it and locked it back in. So it's at its full extreme position to create that first, or what will be the first uh, recess. We're going to use one of the larger pieces as well. So I've got a bit of brown oak. I've measured it. <laughs> excuse me, I've measured it already, and we we're at 46 uh, mil. So I've got a set of dividers here. I've managed to work out with my lengthy um, education that half of 46 is 23. So what we're going to do is pop the center of one side of the divider over the center point, which I've done with a little pencil, and just roughly scribe the outer ring. So I'll just mark that with a pencil just so you can see a little bit easier is to the diameter that we're creating. Now, I've got lots of little billets back here, so if I do make a mistake and I've gone too big with my recess, I can put another one in, or I can turn another one to fit. So it's not over-accurate, you're turning, just I would say start a little bit inward of your line and slowly sort of creep out as you as you sort of refine that shape. I'm going to go with, I don't know, what should we go? Let's go with a parting tool to start with. So let's just bring my tool rest back a little bit. And if you're going to use a parting tool to do this job, you've got to think about a couple of things, especially a regular parting tool. It's quite a deep chisel, okay? And if I start with this tool rest just on center line, I'm going to be cutting way above. So I'm going to drop the tool rest but also I've brought it back a little bit because of the shape of the parting tool. I want to make sure that I'm actually being supported properly. So I've come back a wee bit and I've dropped it down a little bit. Yes, we've got Craig with some questions. Yes. Uh, Jim, B's, uh, Jim B is asking, uh, can you sing the song? Can you sing uh, No, <laughs> it, it was a rugby song and it's not for broadcasting really. So, uh, But Craig's got quite a few that he might uh, fill in later. Definitely not for broadcasting. Another question, all right? Uh, we're okay, for, we're the okay for the minute? Yeah. So uh, the other thing that I was talking about before we um, had to go offline for a while was that once we've um, offset that chuck, make sure you start the lathe at a slower speed. So ideally, right the way down to zero, start the machine, then creep the speed up gently because you don't know how uneven or unbalanced that piece is going to be. Um, and you don't want any accidents, you know, you've, you've, you've been turning at a really, really fast speed, you then suddenly turn a, an offset piece on and it's wobbling all over the place. So just a little bit of care. There we are. So all I'm going to do to start with is make my cut, and I want to be down around about three mil deep. There we are. That's about three mil. I'm not quite up to the line yet. 
And now we've done that flat cut with the parting tool. I can take the waste or the rest of the waste out with a with a gouge, something a little bit bigger that does the job a bit quicker. Let's just turn the lace speed up a little bit more if I can. Yeah. And remember what I was saying earlier was that I want to keep the bottom of this recess as flat as I possibly can. So we all know what's coming next, don't we? We've got the Colwyn Way signature skew chisel here. We're just going to run that along the bottom. Just as a little negative rake scraper. Ideal for that sort of thing. Yes, Craig. Does the chuck come with instructions, or is it trial and error? Um, yes, in both counts. It does come with instructions. We are busy putting, to pl to putting together a few videos and some even more greater detailed instructions. But also, there's a lot of trial and error. Because certainly when you start going to what I call the 3D projects, so this is flat work. So what I'm doing here and what Jason done last week was flat work. But there are also a lot of projects that you can do um, in the in the sort of 3d sort of um spiral staircase style stuff um so that does take a lot of imagination and every time you get to play with the, the spiraling touch you'll get a little bit a little bit more understanding of it so yeah a bit of both really yes great yeah and maybe you could give david a bit of guidance he's had an incident where a 13 inch rosewood bowl jumped out of the 50 mil o'donnell jewels this is the second time that he's had something similar with the o'donnell but never the sea jewels. Um, he was at the sanding stage running at about 2,000 RPM. Way too fast, unfortunately. 2,000 and a 13 inch bowl. Um, you need to get your speed down. Um, I would go 13 to 1400, absolutely. Um, I don't know what size the footed, but immediately, as soon as you said, as soon as Gray said 2,000, um, my eyes went uh, lit up then. That's too fast. Down to about 13 to 1400. Several things, um, apart from your safety, is the heating up of that bowl. That diameter will heat up so quickly at 2000 revs. I will, I'm only doing 1000 revs here, and this is 100 mil across. Yeah, I know it's, it's eccentric, um, but even when it was um, perfectly round, I was only doing about 1800. So get the speed down. Um, yeah, your, the, the, the depth of your foot could be an issue as well um but i would say foremost it's the it's the speed uh, also it, it, it has the foot split away is the other thing or is it whole because if it hasn't split away in a dovetail there's no reason why that should come out of the chuck generally they come out when the the whole foot comes off yes great and david's commented again could be why it failed the heat um it shouldn't no if if it'll get hot so the timber will split on the end grain um that that would be the issue the speed this would be the centrifugal force which have thrown it out of the chuck because you'll still have an unbalanced piece there you've got end grain and side grain so get that speed down that that's the key there and i think you'll be all right yeah definitely a little bit a little bit slower um i'm guessing that was the pit, bit that i measured it earlier um it's getting close i still still need to take a little bit more away though so a little bit at a time. I'm not going to rush this. We can always take a little bit, a little bit more out. A little tiny bit more. So look, what I've done now, you're, you, I know what the question is going to be. Why am I using the, uh, the signature skew? Let me get this on camera so you can see. So the signature skew has these lovely radius edges. So it runs along the tourist beautifully. It'll um, roll a bead nicely. Um, but what we need to give a nice 90 degree scrape in there is a hard edge. So I need that flat surface of a standard skew. That's why I'm using that one. Oh, I didn't check the size. Let me just double check and make sure we're not too big. So a little bit more, just a little hair off of that. Double check. So it's almost there. I just need to skim that and we'll be in.
There we are, that's fitting nicely. So what we'll do next, we're going to put a little bit of glue on that and I'm going to go with the super glue and I can see there's a question. So what we'll do, we'll glue this in and then when we answer the question, hopefully that will give us enough time for that glue to dry. I'm going to put a little bit of accelerator on the bottom. Wipe off that excess a minute before we start. Yes, Craig, far away. Yeah, just a moment. Can you just remind people what speed you were turning at there? That was a thousand revs. So I need to react quite quickly now with what I'm doing. So I'm going to put this into that hole with accelerator on it. So I'm going to start off in the hole and we're then going to. Tap that in. A little bit more of that accelerator around the edge. Don't, and you don't have to worry here. If you get a little bit of glue on the outside, we're going to skim it at the end. More in there. Give it a quick dab. Watch your eyes. We've spoken about this before. That dust that comes, or the... The... Um, the fumes that come out from there can be quite nasty um, so you've got to watch your eyes we're just going to skim that away a minute lay speed back to zero gently turn that lathe on and we're going to go with a bowl gouge so that's a thousand revs when i start going above that the lathe starts to move you I don't know whether you can see that on the camera, but I'm getting a lot of vibration here now. So that was only 1,070. I turn it down to 1,020. It's all right again. So it's that magic sort of spot. So nice and gentle. If this comes out, then I've got to re reset it. I'm just being quite gentle with it. Again, we remember this is the side grain we're working on. Just a nice gentle drag cut. Now push cut just to clean up. And that's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to worry about it being absolutely flush at this stage. Because if you think, you're going to have a lot of these to do. And so you may as well wait until the end. You've got them all in, they're all glued, and then you can do one nice flush cut to finish them all off. Yes, Craig? You've got a question here from Piers. Uh, he wants to know what's the difference between a normal cryo and the cryo and cryo David Ellsworth signature bowl gauge. Sorry, say that again. Normal what's the cryo. Between the normal cryo and cryo yeah. and the David Ellsworth signature. So the David Ellsworth, a David Ellsworth grind. So David Ellsworth is a very well known wood turner in the US. Look him up. He does some fantastic hollow forms and bowls. Um, but he has developed this grind with massively swept back wings that fold right the way in toward the flute. David Ellsworth grind will be still a cryo gouge and they will mimic um, quarter inch, three eight, half inch, five eight gouges in the US. Um, but it has this sing signature grind when you get it. So that's the only difference. The actual still is the same. It's the, the shape of the grind on the gouge um, as, as it comes. Yes. And there's a question from Maria, for me, actually, on the UJK dovetail jig. Sorry to hijack your demo, Mr. <laughs> um, Maria, just looking at the box joints, yeah, you never flip over the, um, the board. It's always only changing end to end, and you're always against the side stop. Machining fingers on the left-hand side first, and then using those fingers to set up the side stop on the right-hand side. Um, if you need any more help with this, just drop us an email, um, Perhaps include your phone number. I'll give you a call and talk it through. Keep. <laughs> okay. Right then. So if you remember, we made this offset here by moving that all the way to its most extreme. So what we could do now, without moving the hinge bit back here again, if I just undo this main bolt at the underside, and then we're going to move this top section around. So we're actually pivoting that offset, and I'm going to make it to the other side. So literally, I'm going to come all the way around. So let's drag him 
there. So we just move the offset. Now it's going to be on this side. It just means I don't have to always go in and undo that bolt and, and, and pivot with the hinge. So let's tighten that back up again. And don't worry, I'm not going to make you sit there and watch me do loads of these. We're just going to do another two of these and that'll be it. We'll then look at how we finish these off. So back on the lathe, and I am, even though there's no change to the offset, I'm still going to just turn that lathe speed down, start again. Let's go with a nice dark section of timber this time. Give you an idea where, where we are, that we're over the other side of where we were a moment ago. So let's go with a bit of, this is a bit of blackwood. So again, we do the same process. We're going to measure, and we are 34-ish. There we are. Always go slightly smaller, obviously, rather than slightly bigger. 1,000 revs again is working, so we'll go to that. Actually, that pencil line, weirdly, was on the right spot. So, again, parting tool. We're only going to go 3 mil. We are back with a bowl gouge. Flatten off the bottom. It is a little routine that you get yourself in. Just flattening everything, everything down. Back to that square skew. and do your first check. I would say there we probably a good mill and a half to come out of that yet. Sixteenth-ish. Double check. That's pretty good. I reckon I'm going to bully that in. So a bit of glue. A bit of glue. Now, of course, you're not going to be speed turning at home. You don't need to do this really, really quickly. So you could go for, instead of using the CA glue, why not go for something like an epoxy? Um, it takes a little bit longer, but... There's a nice five-minute epoxy that's a good option. Going in. I'm going to just squirt a little bit of accelerator on there just to make sure it goes off. Um, there's a nice five-minute. The Z-poxy is a good option um, if you want to go with a, a, an epoxy uh, glue. And that, like it says there, it'll take five minutes to go off. And it's quite a hard um, glue as well then as well. You, you do well to lose anything from that. A little bit of thin in here would work nicely. But we're just going to go with the, the medium for now. Give it a spray. Wipe off any excess because you don't want it to spray up at your, when you turn the lathe on. There we are. Lay speed. Back to normal, bowl gouge again. So we're going to just do a nice, gentle cut. Yeah. 
So remember that finishing cut is just with the bevel rubbing. All right, let's see where we are. I think we'll just do one more. That'll be it then for this one. So we're going to go with the palest timber that I've got. And again, all I'm going to do is pivot the center pin. We're not going to worry about the, the outside. I'm not going to worry about the hinge setting here. I'm just going to undo this one. And let's go halfway between the two. I want to hear somewhere. So let's come over to this point. There we are. Once you start using this one, you'll you'll get to grips with it fairly quickly. And your imagination then can start working out what you're going to do next. There we are. So lace piece back to zero again. Turn the machine on. And now we've shifted to the in-between position. So in between those um, two points. So let's go one of the bigger white ones, piece of ash here. You know the routine now, so we're going to go... That's 42 mil. So that's similar to the to the oak one. So half my dividers. right there really hard to see that one actually so same thing you know where we are now so passing tool first it's a really cool shaving is coming off that it's really cool There we are. We'll use bowl gowns to take out most of the bulk. And then we're going to scrape the bottom clean. And then size. So we'd check first. And we're way out at the moment. So I've got to take a fair amount away from there. So I'm just going to lift the tool rest of fraction. Use the flat of the skew. It's ever so easy to get impatient and, and think, oh, I'm going to take a bigger cut than I ought to, and then end up having the uh, the little plug wobbling around inside the hole. That's good. Very lucky. A little bit of glue. Just to just be careful with this glue. You know, you. when I say about making sure it's dry before you turn the lathe on, obviously, I'm going to say you must be wearing your safety, a minimum of safety specs, but I would say probably better to go with a full face visor, face shield. Do not do this without either, because um, you don't want to get any of that glue in your face. You all know all about it if you do. And we're just wiping off the excess of both the glue and the accelerator. Lay speed to zero, turn the machine on. Just get yourself in that routine. 
Then we can get our lay speed back up, back up to the thousand. Turn off the excess. Okay, there we go. So that's that last little bit of excess gone. What we need to do now is we're going to trim everything up. I'm not going to do any more, any more holes. You've, I think you've seen enough of that. So let's get him back central. And all that's going to require now, because what we've been doing so far, we made one adjustment to the hinge back here. And then from then on, we've just been literally pivoting it around. So all I have to do now is bring that hinge back in again. So let's go with our all ended Allen key. I'm going to remove that single hinge. Get everything back central. We we'll skim that surface. Then we're going to remove it from the chuck. Skim the back. I want to show you some wood plate jaws. I made a, a new set of uh, jaws this morning um, to go over the wood plates. It's probably one of the most um, versatile jaws that we use is the wood plate jaws because they can be made to whatever shape you you need whatever project um, you're doing. There we are. So back to central. So let's tighten them up. And this is your chance to skim and sand, basically. So back in, expand the chuck. If you feel you need to skim that surface, and I do, then let's get nice and central. Lay speed to zero, turn the machine on, up your speed. There we are. Let's go with the larger of the skews now. We're just going to, I want to be on center. a little bit more and then we're going to sand just getting all that old glue off there we are the outside edge is already done so i don't need to worry about that happy with that look so you can see the sort of effect we're getting so we're going to put dust extraction on. I'm going to sand from 150 to 4400. I'm not going to do any more. Um, and then we can take it off and take the back nice and clean. So uh, 150 to 4400. So dust extraction going on now. So 240. And then 400. Again, take your time. You don't need to be rushing this. And if you want to go a little bit further, do. One thing I would say, if you're going to, you might feel you want to use an epoxy resin on these and a countertop resin would work, actually would work really, really well. Um, countertop resins are designed for this sort of thing. We've had, 
or countertops. We've we had the question the other day on what would you use or would countertop resin be okay with um, hot cups, that sort of thing. Well, I've used countertop resin on some coasters I've made, and it has worked well actually i've done some tables with casting resin not so well they've risen but the uh, countertop resin has been all right it's been really good so countertop resin is okay yes craig question yeah a question from ben um why did we stop doing the indexing holes on the back of the sk114 chuck um quite simply the indexing of um uh, bits and bobs that we were selling around that just just didn't create any interest no one was was that interested in it at all um the machine the extra machining around that um chuck obviously put the price up a lot more and so rather than put the price up we decided to take that little um that little extra away um we didn't have a proper indexing system to go with it so the loss was negligible and it meant that we could keep the chucks down in price i'm using a lemon oil there and i'll tell you why i'm using a lemon oil because my finishing oil has just run out um and lemon oil is one of those it's, it's just it's obviously a citrus oil um but it's one of the natural oils so what a lemon oil will won't contain over a finishing oil is a dryer okay so it just means that you're gonna have to wait a little bit longer for that oil to dry but use the 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 old technique of sanding the oil in so go with a, a 600 or 800 grit abrasive lay three down to really really slow sand it in create some friction and, um, and burnish that slurry that builds up between the dust and the oil will give you a lovely silky finish and then keep applying the oil do that sort of three or four times and you get a really really nice nice finish that's that's true of, of all of the oils you, you can you do them that way and you'll get a really nice shiny finish the more you build them up I've just noticed one thing I never showed you guys, actually. Um, when we were right at the beginning and we were just gluing on the bit of waste um, plywood to the bit of timber, I'm using the general duty um, sticks and um, just my the Bosch um, glue gun there. So it's, it's nothing fancy. It's just the PKP18E, and it's just used an awful lot for that sort of thing. Anything where I'm using a glue chuck um, or sacrificial chuck, that sort of thing, on the lathe um, and just general general duty glue sticks yes greg question from maria um is there a way of doing colwyn's offset pendants with this chuck i haven't found a way yet um we we are continually looking at ways to sort of add worth to things and it's it's something that i've considered before about whether we could do an, an ad sort of an ad adaption to it which you could hold physically hold them um i haven't i've still prefer to do that sort of thing um as the demo um was last time in these the um either the wood plate jaws or the um soft jaws because you can tailor make them and like i say we're going to now just tailor make this to suit the um the coaster by putting that on a little bit of dowel in there just pinching it up you can then drill the offset to wherever you want it and wood plate jaws i think they're so good because the wood plate jaw is this bit here so it's the bit that's actually in the metal bit that's in there we then screw our wood plates to them i made these this morning this is not from a disc i made this from a strip of of um, plywood um, and just sanded the edges away i've drilled a hole down through the middle because i'm about to hold that in there and we're going to turn our recess to hold um, our um, coaster. So no, so I haven't. It just it was a little bit complicated for my little brain to 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 work out. I think Maria. I think that's the reason because those wood plates do the job so well. Um, I just didn't I didn't see the need. So look, I'm just going to pop that bit of dowel in. Just, it, I mean, it can be as, as little as a pencil. You can put a pencil in the middle and just cramp up onto it. As long as you've got these solid when you turn them. That's the, all we're worried about. It needs to be solid. You can't have them rattling around in the chuck and then turn the recess. So we're going to measure our diameter. That's 95.
Now, I've got a little bit more freedom here, of course. Because, it, because the jaws move, I don't have to worry so much about being, you know, millimetre perfect. Saying that, you don't want to be miles away. So look, there's the mark. What we can do, just roughly hold that coaster up. How close am I? I'm not going to worry about that. That's pretty good. Three mil again. I mean, if you want to go a bit deeper, just remember this is screwed on. So again, you don't want to go through and into your screws. I'm going to use the parting tool to get my depth. And then bowl gouge, like like um, like we've done on the coaster, bowl gouge to do the rest of the bolt removal. Because that's a bit of dowel in the middle, I can turn into the dowel. Not a problem. And then we're just going to true up in the same way, true up with the skew chisel. So we've got a nice true outer edge. And then you've made yourself another set of jaws to suit your current project. That's what I like about them so much. There we are. So let's take out our bit of dowel. Get it out of the way. Take our coaster out of its eccentric chuck. Unscrew those. And you've got yourself your custom made jaws. Now, I would certainly go with plywood, not MDF here. MDF tends to delaminate quite easily. So go with your ply, 1000 revs. Get rid of that waste piece. Now you have the opportunity to make these as thin as you want them. Check that, and we're ready for sanding. Yes, Craig. Yes, I've got a couple questions. One, uh, the first one is from Paul Arthur, um, who just commented he managed to glue when you were talking about CA glue, managed to glue his son's robot to his leg whilst fixing it. <laughs> so, um, well done, Paul. Um, but the question from Paul: Can you use one set of jaw plates to create multiple jaws by screwing them on and off, or will they wear out? Um, they, they absolutely, they will wear out over time, but we, we are, you know, I guess it depends on the use because I was going to about to say they will wear out over time because it's timber, but I've got some jaws that I've had now well over 10 years. Um, and they're still being used. The thing is with them, you know, you may find one day you just need to skim a little millimeter off the next project you do, I'm going to just skim another mill millimeter off and so on. So they're, they're wear for that reason alone. 
Um, but I've got there's certain projects that I've got my settable plates drawers. They will never change. So this, for instance, will now become for coasters, um, a, a coaster jaw, and it won't change. Um, the jewellery one are the same. Um, it doesn't get get moved. I I turn the pieces of jewellery to that size and and nothing else. So you might find then you want to want several sets. Taking them on and off the wood plate jaws does become a bit of an issue because they're screwed on with wood screws. Those will become worn. Those the screwing points. So those would be the that the only issue. Yes, Craig. Yeah, another couple of questions coming in. So, um, question from Ben: What tool would you recommend to clean up the inside of a hollowed form after using carbides uh, once he's removed the bulk? Depends on what you want to with, with that hollow form. What you want it to be. So, if it's a hollow form with a very very small opening at the top, I wouldn't worry too much. A bit of blackboard paint on the inside, it adds a bit of mystery, doesn't it? But if it's an open hollow form, then you're going to shear scrape. So find yourself a decent shear scraper, get it on the 45 and scrape from center back up. Make sure you've got that tool rest in a decent a decent um, amount so it's supporting all the way. So a shear scraper would be my, my advice, really. And a question from Jim, is there a reason why you didn't just cut up with a parting tool while on the spiral chuck? Um, it's, it's quite a deep uh, piece of turning now. So it's a, almost 100 mil and a spiral, uh, a parting tool down end grain just doesn't like it that much. It will generate quite a lot of heat. I didn't want to have too much flexing around there. So I just find this a lot easier. Um, and also I wanted to, to, you know, to, to clean up that top surface as well. So that was the only reason. Um, and they're just so easy to to, um, to use, you know. Bit of extraction on now. We're just going to very quickly sand this up. You're tempted with epoxy, and you're making epoxy coasters. Really, if you're not using countertop resin then you'll have to mechanically polish that so that would mean putting them back on the lathe using a burnishing cream and then again this is the best way there we are that's all we're going to do you know the form you know you're going to spend a little bit longer doing doing this process than i'm doing here and before we wrap this one up i just want to say for those people that stuck with us while we were going through a little bit of an issue earlier. Thank you very much, of course, for singing songs and all those sorts of things. There we are. A little bit of that lemon oil on the bottom. Let's just give it a little bit of a run over with a 600 low speed so you don't get a face full of oil, really. And as that starts to get absorbed, then you can turn the speed up a little bit. Another coat of oil and give it a decent burnish. A little bit of tissue, just to give it a hard burnish. And then that, that should be that then. Okay, how are we doing there for questions, Craig? Are we good? No, a lot of uh, thank yous and praise. Excellent demo. So uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Yeah, thanks for watching. And also, like I said earlier, thanks so much for sticking with us. Um, if you're watching this later on, um, I hope you've enjoyed that. There we are. There's our offset coasters. There will be more coming from the offset eccentric chucks as we go through the next few months. There's so many things it can do. Um, but once again, we've done another Woodworking Wisdom uh, live stream for you. So thanks ever so much for joining us. Back tomorrow with Ben, of course, and then again on Thursday with uh, with Craig. So thanks for watching. I've been Colin Way. Bye-bye.